Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited today because I missed the podcast on Confucius and that was, that was so heartbreaking for me. But today we're going to redeem that, that I'm back working on a bit of Chinese history because I do love China. I think Chinese history is so interesting. So we've got back with us again because he is so awesome and so much fun and he knows his onions. Or for those of you who don't understand that, he knows his shit. We've got with us back Jonathan Clement. So if you don't know who he is, go out and just read about this guy, grab his books. But he's written a book, which we're going to be talking about this book today, and it's titled Wu. The Chinese Empress Who Schemed, Seduced, and Murdered Her Way to Becoming a Living God. I mean, come on, this is just going to be an awesome podcast. Welcome, Jonathan. I'm so glad to have you back on. Happy to be back, Alina. I am. Do you know what? You've, your title says it all. Schemed, Seduced, and Murdered. I mean, how much of a better podcast can we have right now? Well, I, I think my publisher came up with that title, and we've kind of been... <laughs> a bit embarrassed about it ever since because you know you, you get a lot of sort of people arguing that well did she really murder anyone and like yes yes she did but okay um but also you know we don't have the word uh, empress in the main title and that's confused a lot of chinese readers who thought this was a book about the state of Wu. and we have to say no sorry to disappoint you there you're about you know a few centuries out but um but yes this the it, it's uh um it was a very um it was a very good book to write, and uh, it's been translated into Chinese twice. Jesus, uh, wow. Yeah, and, and it's also available in Polish um, for those people that, you know, fancy reading it in Polish. Um, <laughs> is that a hit there? Is, is that a yeah, hit? It, yeah, I mean, Polish, Czech, all kinds of things. Um, it, it's one of my most translated books because, um, you know, who can resist a bad girl like Wu? I mean, this is, this is the whole thing, though, that when we find people in history that are so interesting, you've got to write about them. Um, yes, and, and there's oddly little written about Wu. There's been a, quite a lot in the last decade. There's been a few books written about her uh, more recently. But because she's so controversial and because she's so politically um, uh, contentious, um, you do find people getting divided into camps about her, about whether or not she was this fantastic feminist icon or whether or not she was the most evil woman who ever lived. And, and there are books you know, about both of those angles. Um, so, uh, yeah, she does invite a lot of controversy. And she's an incredibly popular character on Chinese television and in Chinese films. There's been you know, dozens of, of shows about her and her era, the Tang Dynasty, because the Tang Dynasty is is a very cosmopolitan time in Chinese history. It's where you've got all the nice frocks. Um, and uh, I had one editor say to me about, well, don't forget to mention the cushions. I want to know what the cushions were like in the palace. And I was like, really? Is that a thing? OK, well, we'll do that, too. Um, so she's a kind of Cinderella figure in, in Chinese history, but she's also kind of a serial killer. So for those <laughs> Chinese girls who want to watch a TV show which has got kind of nice dresses and stabbings, woo's your woman. You know what? I, 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 has this been made into a proper TV series yet? Oh, many times. Many, many times. But in, in English, in, not, not in Chinese. Oh, uh, not in English. In fact, about 10 years ago, someone did actually buy the rights to my book to turn it into a TV series. And um, I spent a very happy couple of months putting together a 10-hour outline for a kind of HBO Wu series. Um, because the thing about her time is it was genuinely cosmopolitan. You had... Uh, blue-eyed girls in the taverns of Chang'an. You had Persian refugees showing up, uh, fleeing the Arab invasions. Um, you had ambassadors showing up from the Eastern Roman Empire. So you can actually tell a Tang Dynasty story and have a very diverse ethnic cast. It's not just a bunch of Chinese people shouting at each other. Um, so it was a good, good kind of option. But, you know, uh, as what happens with 99% of all option deals, uh, you know, they renewed it a couple of times, but nothing happened. You know, rights came back to me. So. What? Okay. If anybody is listening out there, you are a writer, producer, director, I don't care. Grab yourself this because I would I would be there watching this every Sunday or Saturday or whenever you're going to put it on TV. I'll be sitting there and watching this because I love this kind of stuff. It's great. It brings us into this sort of... It, it's very difficult to imagine these sorts of things, you know, us sitting here reading a book. Yes, we can imagine to a certain point, but being able to watch it on TV where you see all the colours and the people and the interactions, and it just, just brings it back to life, doesn't it? It does. And I think as well, the thing to bear in mind is that 
you talk about seeing the colours, seeing the people. There are some real visual shocks when you tell the story of the Tanganacy. They have these incredible kind of alien hairstyles oh, that wow. just go all over the place, uh, and they look like um, something out of out of Star Wars. Um, and uh, there were various fashions in makeup for very severe colours on your faces. So you had women walking around looking like they were kabuki actors sometimes. Um, and you know, so, so this all makes things like super Game of Thrones fun. I'm in. I'm going to pitch this. This is what we're going to do. We're going to start <laughs> up a new campaign, History Hat campaign, to get this on TV. Uh, maybe I might be able to get a part. Would I be able to get a part in this? Somewhere? Oh yeah. Oh definitely. Perfect. There's there's, there's plenty of roles for you, um, uh, and I think we'll get to that later on. Um, the 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 thing about the Tang Dynasty is that. Uh, it saw a, a sudden shift in standards of beauty, um, mainly brought about by Wu and her family, uh, other members of her family, uh, which meant that ever since China has had to have a bifurcated standard of beauty. It's not just about stick thin supermodels anymore uh, after the time of Wu. Okay, let's come back to that. Let's come back. You've just done us a beautiful pitch. I don't think we need to hit off with the first question, really. Um, I think we should just dive straight in, really, right. to the second one. Because that, mm. that was, I think you just pitched her really well to us. I don't think we need to go any further than that. So let's talk about um, the tomb of Empress Rue. I mean, what's so controversial about it? Okay. Um, when she died, it was 705 AD. So we're looking at the what we would call the Dark Ages. We're talking about the rest of, roughly the time that Sutton Hoo uh, was, uh, was being, you know, uh, thrown together in uh, in Europe um, and she was 80 years old and she was laid to rest uh, with her second husband who was the uh, the Gaozong emperor um, and her tomb is the only tomb in China that contains two um, sovereign um, rulers that's the thing about Wu is that she is the only woman ever to have ruled China in her own name now you may have heard of other empresses um, like uh, you know Sir Xi the Empress Dowager and you may have heard of other women like uh, Empress Lu or, 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 or Zhang Qing the wife of Chairman Mao um, but none of them actually officially held power Wu was crowned as the ruler of China. And so sometimes you'll hear people describe her as Emperor Wu because they're trying to make a distinction between being an imperial consort uh, and being an actual sovereign emperor. Um, so Wu's tomb, I've, I've been there, it's fantastic. It, it's about an hour outside of what is now Xi'an in, in China. Um, and it's built inside a mountain. Um, it's never been excavated for reasons we can go into later on. Wow. And there's this long spirit road that goes up to it. Um, and uh, on either side of the spirit road, there are these two massive hills that are shaped like boobs. Uh, and they've got these little guard towers on top of them, like, like little erect nipples. Um, and these are called Naitoshan, the nipple hills. Um, and the story goes that Wu's, uh, the, the Gaozong, uh, when he was selecting the site for his tomb, he said, you know what, those mountains really remind me of your chest. I want to have my tomb here. Um, and in fact, if you look at the tomb from above and you, you turn it around because south is at the top of a Chinese map, you realize the tomb looks like a giant woman's body kind of spread eagled on the ground um, with, with, with the nipple hills uh, very prominent. But that's not the controversial thing about Wu's, Wu's tomb. What's Hold controversial on. about? That's not the controversial thing about her. OK, go on. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the, the fact that, that, you know, she's buried with her husband uh, in, in a very intimate place in a giant representation of a spread eagle naked woman on the ground. That is not a thing. No, the thing um, is that when someone dies in China, it's very common, particularly for the imperial families, um, to, to, to say to their kids, look, I don't want to show you funeral. It's very Confucian to say, just just put me in a box, put me in the ground. I don't want to have, you know, any, and no fuss, no fuss. OK. And it's traditional for your kids to disobey you, for their one act of disobedience to you in their whole Confucian life is to give you a showy funeral. And so it's quite normal for someone to say, don't have anything in memory of me. Just, you know, just 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 get rid of me and get on with your lives, everybody. Save your cash. Don't send flowers, whatever. Um, in the case of Wu's family, they took her at her word. Her gravestone is there and it's completely blank what no one would say anything about her and um, and some people have tried to put a really stupid spin on this over history going well they wanted her deeds to speak for themselves but no what happened was is that her her reign um caused such a rupture to chinese society was so pearl clutchingly shocking 
to conservatives um, and, and to the many men who are in charge of writing the history that came after her that they tried to wipe her regime out. It wasn't quite carving people's names off tombs like the Egyptians did, but we were heading that way. Wu's reign was, uh, was suppressed. Her achievements were overwritten or, or, or underplayed. Um, and for a thousand years after her death, the official story in China was that Wu's era was a, was a terrible abomination where women were in control and everything just turned to shit as fast as possible and that no sane regime would ever let this happen again. And this is why she's the only um, sovereign empress. Clearly written by a man. Yes, clearly written by everything was written by the men. That's the thing. And in, when it, the, 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 the historical record um, is uh, is in the hands of men. Um, and Wu's reign saw um, a, a degree of equality for women. It saw women put to position of power. Her prime minister, uh, very famously, was a woman called Shang Guan Wan Er, uh, who was the greatest poet of her day, almost none of whose poetry now survives. Um, uh, in fact, think about Shang Guan Wan Er. She's the great thing about her. Uh, she's, she's one of my favorite characters in Chinese history. She was a slave girl in the palace. Her father was implicated in a coup and things didn't go very well for the family. And, but she was very smart. And she was very eloquent. And so Wu started using her as a speech writer and she ended up becoming Wu's chief minister. Um, and uh, she had a famously lopsided haircut because there was a scar on the side of her face when Wu went for her with a fruit knife one night after an argument over a boy. Um, um, but apart from that, the thing that Shang Guan Wan Er's tomb has just been discovered in the last four or five years in China. Oh, wow. And it has been thoroughly desecrated. The tiles have been ripped off. It hasn't just been robbed. It's been cancelled. Because, you know, what we don't want is to admit that China was in the hands of a chief minister who was actually better than all the men at running it. Oh, that is such a shame. I mean, I... I definitely love to live that time. I mean, women ruling the world. Hell yes. Well, it wasn't great for everybody. Uh, that's the thing about a lot of Chinese history um, is that what you're looking at is an elite of, let's say, 5,000 people living in an incredibly modern and comfortable existence. You know, you have all mod cons, your clothes are washed for you, your food is put on the table. You've got air conditioning of sorts during the summer and, and heat during the winter. You can send out for ice cream and you'll get it no matter what the season. It's mm. a pretty cushy life, but it's only available to what we won't even call the 1%, to a tiny fraction of the 1%. Everybody else is literally living in the dark ages. And so ah. there is a fierce absolutely fierce contest to stay in that palace and that is what causes all of the drama um, about the various Chinese dynasties um, the fact that you, it's you know it might all seem nice on the surface and there might be wonderful stories of you know incredible banquets and you know wonderful orgies and you know whatever however you put one foot wrong your whole family will be will be wiped out um, and or, or possibly even worse, you know, you'll end up having to live outside the palace, which is a fate worse than death. So there is this incredible tension, this incredible sexual tension in the palace, not the least because, you know, the emperor has all the power. Um, he is surrounded by by no men. It's only eunuchs and women in the inner palace. Um, so if you want to do well for yourself, you've got to get your daughter into the palace. You've got to get her to attract the eye of the emperor. And the perfect career path would be become a concubine or hopefully his true wife, his, his empress, uh, bear him a male heir, get the male heir accepted. And then you become the grandfather of um, the, the next emperor. Uh, and your daughter is, you know, in a position of power authority and she can get jobs for all of her brothers and her cousins and so on. The trouble with that is, is that that's a very long series of, uh, of boxes to tick. Um, and it's, so in the case of somebody like Wu, she goes into the palace at 13 years old. Um, her son would eventually become emperor in 684. Um, so she has, so there's three or four decades where she has to hang on. She has to hang on to her looks. She has to hang on to her power. She has to stop any other woman having a kid with the emperor who the emperor likes more than her sons. And so you can you can see, I, I think, already how the kind of soap opera level of Chinese history starts to ramp up, because this isn't just Henry VIII with six wives. This is Henry VIII with 100 wives. 
Any oh, wow. one of whom could be displaced by the next teenage slapper to walk in and catch his eye. <laughs> you know, um, I, 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 I love Chinese history, but also in Japan, you've got it's quite a parallel, quite similar, really, if yes. you're looking at, at both. And it, it is just this this one huge drama. You know, I don't want her. She did mm. this. She has a better she has better service. It's, it's just the the cattiest, cattiest, cattiest women you will come well, across. Well, yes, but let's be fair to the women. Uh, in many cases here, it's not their fault. This is all they have. Um, so much of the drama in Chinese history and indeed Japanese history is about what we call the affines, where we get the word affinity from. And the affines are the in-laws. It's not about the men. It's about the fathers and the husbands. It's not the husbands. So it's about the fathers and the brothers and the and the nephews and the cousins, who are all backing this woman as their one path into power. And so yes, it is catty. And yes, there are some you know um, very kind of female arguments going on, shall we say, if that doesn't get me into trouble. But um, what often <laughs> happens in Chinese history, uh, I mean, almost all the time, is that women get the blame. Uh, right, right from the moment when Confucius said a woman can cause a man to lose his head, a woman can cause a man to lose his post. The women are getting the blame for, you know, turning the heads of these, you know, um, these dizzy little men who can't control themselves. Um, but actually, the, the women are really the sharp end of an entire family that's in trying to interfere in politics. In Japan, just as an aside, it's even more of a big deal because the emperors have to be um, descended from the, the house of the sun goddess, which tends to mean everyone's marrying their cousin, and you get these ridiculous situations where some, someone's only got one male grandparent. Um, so it's, it's even harder to kind of get into that to that dynasty. But it is it is at least theoretically possible. No one I know has ever managed to do it because sometimes the data is so hard to get, particularly when you're not allowed to to name women in in, in chronicles. Um, but it would be possible to chart a history of, say, China, not through the emperors, but through the affines, through the families at the side who for centuries are just marrying their daughters in. And no, then, that, makes, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, and Wu came from one of those families. The Wu family and the Yang family were particularly prominent. Um, and her, her mother was a Yang girl and her father was a Wu man. So, they were, so, the, so the two families were already kind of uh, cooperating and you know Wu got sent into the palace about 13 as a very low-ranking concubine uh, so you know they weren't that powerful she was basically just a chambermaid um, and she worked her way up to empress from that her sister um, also uh, had something of a palace career um, in fact Wu's second husband seemed to have a thing for both of the Wu girls which was a bit pervy um, <laughs> but, you know, no comment uh, no yeah no comment right do you know what Hmm. we've gone on a rant here but we like to go on a rant here let's go back to our questions because you mentioned she's buried with her second husband indeed right so who is her first husband okay so Wu goes into the palace at 13 years old and she's a very low-ranking concubine um the, the 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 idea that she's married to the emperor is is a very um anglophone way of describing it in fact the emperor only ever has one wife the main empress but it is understood that he will be having sex with a hundred other women at some point he has he has sexual access to all the women in the palace um and of course all of the affines are kind of hoping that that's going to happen so depending on who you talk to because the story changes at different points in his life either she was just some chambermaid or she was uh, a low-ranking palace servant who caught the emperor's eye. He called her fair, flirty Wu, Wu Mei Yang, and she got to hang out with him when he was testing out the horses, and, and they became very chatty and friendly, and they had a relationship, or didn't. It's not clear, because on the, seriously, the, the story is subject to much fake news. So, uh, but but Taizong was the, he wasn't the founder of the Tang Dynasty, he was the son of the founder of the Tang Dynasty, but he was an incredibly... Um, proficient warrior um, a very dangerous man he put his father on the throne basically as a young prince and then he told his father to abdicate and he took over as the second uh, tang emperor um, he did so by killing two of his brothers in a massive fight in the palace uh, and we'll get we'll, we'll talk more about that later on um, but by his 50s he was a broken man he he'd you know he'd had a long life of fighting um, he had uh, had a disastrous attempt to invade Korea, which didn't go well. 
Um, and so he was kind of giving up on on the whole war thing, and he was spending more and more time with the ladies of the palace and just enjoying himself. And then he fell ill and he died. Now Wu was changing his bedclothes. This is either because she's the only girl he trusted because he loved her so much, if you believe that story, or because she's the chambermaid. That's her job. Either way, his son, Gao Zong, comes to see him. And Wu, so the story goes, seduces Gao Zong. Allegedly, she bangs him at the bedside of her dying husband. Now, at this time, Wu's about 24 years old and Gao Zong's about 21. Um, tai Zong then dies. And as is traditional, all of the women of Tai Zong's palace are rounded up and sent to a nunnery, uh, to a Buddhist nunnery. So they're going to say prayers for his soul for the rest of their lives. No other man can touch them, of course. So their heads are shaved. They're packed off to a nunnery. Within two years, Wu is back in the palace because Gao Zong can't get her out of his head. Uh, he's obviously got a thing for the Wu girls, too. Now, here's the thing. Gao Zong is not the man who invites her back to the palace. It's Gao Zong's wife. Gao Zong's wife, Empress Wung, has not had a male heir. And she's absolutely petrified that Xiao Lang Di, a wriggly young girl who has caught the emperor's eye, is going to supplant her at the palace. So she brings Wu back. She knows that Gao Zong is carrying a torch for this girl. But she also, so she brings Wu in as a kind of honey trap. But she brings her back to the palace, secure in the knowledge that she's been pre-disastered. Wu is damaged goods. At any point that Wu might seem to be gaining the upper hand, the Empress can turn around and go, remind me again, you fucked my husband's dad, right? Oh, my God. This is, I'm, I'm sitting at the edge of my seat going, oh, my God, <laughs> what's going to happen next? Well, <laughs> what happens next is that Wu charms the shit out of everybody. Her hair, supposedly, which used to be six feet long, has magically grown back after being shaved off in the nunnery. And there's a lot of prevarication. This is why the story is so difficult to tell, because everything I've told you about her banging Gao Zong at the bedside, that's now been wiped out. We're not talking about that. We're not discussing that. Oh, no, I wasn't really a concubine of Tai Zong. I was just like, a, you know, we were just good friends. It's OK for me to hang out with his son. Um, oh. Over the next two years, Wu... Um, insinuates herself into the palace life she wins a lot of people over this is the thing about Wu. she must have had incredible charisma to get away with this because she's starting from nothing remember this she doesn't have an army behind her that's backing her up she's doing all of this just with the way she can look at people so um, can i just throw something in here so yeah. she's we're talking about her charisma yes so she wasn't so beautiful and you know this 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 absolute stunner at this point she's doing this with her personality Yes, it's very difficult to tell at 1,200 years remove, 1,300 years remove, what she was like as a person. We have artistic representations of her, but they go all over the place. Um, actually, there's a statue of Buddha, there's a statue of the Virakana Buddha in Luoyang that supposedly has Wu's face. Um, and um, <laughs> you don't get where you are in the palace without being probably one of the most attractive women in the world already but it's very possible that i mean th there's not a lot said about her looks and i think if she were super super hot that would have been a comment made in the annals as well um so you know her her kind of great niece uh, yang wei fei is one of the most beautiful women in chinese history but Wu is not described in that way so uh I would say that it's very likely that, you know, her looks were not the thing that made a difference, that there was something else about her. She was a very smart woman. She was incredibly well read. She was really good at wordplay. Um, and there must have been something about her that made her bend these men to her will. Later in life, she did have an army to back her up. She did have that kind of power. Um, but, you know, when, she, when she's in her 20s and her 30s, she's got literally nothing. So it has to be the force of her own will. Fair enough. I'm just, history is littered with these sorts of women. For hmm. example, the probably the biggest example we can think of is Cleopatra. Yes. You know, people say, oh, she was beautiful, but no, she was really ugly. We will never know the truth behind any of these, except for hmm. obviously that some of the more modern um, technologies where we do have photographs and we can analyze, hmm. but, Beauty also changes and standards of beauty change. Uh, like you said, we're going to touch on this again. Mm. Um, they, they change over time. So what we find beautiful now mm. might not translate into what was beautiful back then. Exactly. Exactly. 
Um, and in Wu's, I mean, we can talk about this now if you like. In, in Wu's case, um, the, the standard of beauty in the Tang dynasty uh, changed along with her. She was very much hit the zeitgeist uh, because, as noted already with the Nipple Hills, she was a big girl. Um, we do know this about her. Um, and uh, up until that point, the basic standards of beauty um, for Chinese women, obviously, as defined by men, were very neotenous. They favored wriggly, thin, um, young girls. One of the problems with writing about Chinese medieval history is so much of the sexual politics turns into paedophilia quite fast. And so uh, I do wonder sometimes if some of the stories they end up telling from Chinese history will be untellable within a generation. Uh, because you're dealing with people who are frankly underage. Um, but anyway, Wu was not like that at all. Wu was, um, I'm not saying she's fat. She was... Uh, uh, curvy. She was curvy. She was definitely curvy. There's one photograph of her where she looks a lot like Kate Winslet, you know, before Kate Winslet started, you know, starving herself. Um, and so she had a, you know, she had a certain curviness to her. Um, and over the years... Um, over the century that followed the life of Wu, we see radical changes in the way that women are depicted in art of the Tang Dynasty and in, in statuary. Um, so, uh, because the Tang Dynasty is a time of great prosperity. It's this huge kind of climatic optimum. There's fantastic wealth coming in on the Silk Road. There's all kinds of new foods. People can eat more. Um, and uh, the, the, the men of the Tang Dynasty, particularly after the time of Wu, started to, to favor curvy girls. And frankly, the, the men of the Tang Dynasty got pretty curvy as well. I mean, Tang Dynasty, <laughs> Tang Dynasty wrestling does not survive in China, but it does survive in Japan where it's sumo. And so sumo wrestlers have this sort of Tang Dynasty fatness to them. Oh, that's interesting. So, um, so the thing about uh, uh, the temple statues are, and the funerary statues is, is that it is possible to see the women gaining weight from about the middle of the seventh century until the uh, until the end of the, until about eight hundred, um, maybe eight fifty. You see the statue because the thing about about funerary statues is we can date the time of the funeral, so we know when the statue was made, and so we can track the different hairstyles of the Tang Dynasty, but also the fact that these women are basically getting fatter. Um, and so, uh, so by the time of Wu's grandson, where he had a very famous love affair with Yang Guifei, Yang Guifei was famously fat. Um, and, and there's this Chinese proverb um, that, that compares these two women in history. Uh, one of them is this very, very famous thin girl. And one of them is, is Yang Guifei, who is fat. And it says they're both beautiful. We, we understand that both of these are beautiful standards. But basically, so for the, for the Tang Dynasty, after the time of Wu, fat girls are the thing. You, thin girls disappear from funerary statues unless they are servants. Because the pretty girls, the centerpieces of the paintings and so on, they are all wearing quite voluminous dresses. They've got double chins. Um, and uh, that, that, that is what is now regarded as beautiful. And, and Wu seems to have played a, a very big part in that. Um, I mean, you, you could say that cause and effect is difficult to argue and that maybe this was something that was generally happening anyway. And one of the things that made Wu so influential was because she happened to fit that body type and that look. Um, but I think it's much more likely that she kind of dragged society with her to say, no, look at me, I'm beautiful. I think I would fit in that time period. I think I was born too late. <laughs> Gosh, but that is, I love this. I mean, I, I know we're going to talk about some, some very scandalous things, but from a, from a female perspective, especially nowadays, you know, mm. we're, again, you have to be thin or you have to have a big bottom. That's the new in thing for fashion or, you know, and these standards of beauty are so, and, and but they've been like this for thousands of years mm. that you need to follow fashion, that you need to be skinny or you need to have big eyes. So women used makeup to, you know, it, mm. it is such... I don't know how to explain this. It is such a difficult thing for women to be able to do because if you don't fit into mm. any of these norms of the time, yeah. you're not classified as beautiful. Yeah, I have to say, I, I play a little game, which I can't really discuss with anyone, so I better not say on a podcast. But when I'm walking down the street in China, I spend a lot of time staring at the girls and saying to myself, you are a Song Dynasty supermodel. You are a Tang Dynasty supermodel. You are a uh, Zhou Dynasty supermodel. Because you see all these different faces in paintings and statues and so on. 
Um, but, and, but you can chart that, you know, some artists has obviously decided a particular look is what matters at a particular time. Um, and then you don't see that, that look again after that dynasty ends because, you know, fashions change or, as you say, different kinds of makeup turn up. It's, you know, suddenly painting your lips green isn't a thing anymore, um, for example, or uh, shaving off your eyebrows isn't a thing anymore. Um, and so, um, so yes, there, there are all kinds of, uh, I, I, I reckon I can see about 20 different Chinese standards of beauty in women. Um, much less in men. I, they are still visible in men. I mean, I can still look at someone and go, oh, yeah, you are a Communist Party poster boy. <laughs> I see that sometimes. But a lot of the Communist Party uh, poster boys are themselves, they, they themselves have the kind of chiseled features of, uh, of Chinese opera actors from 100 years before. So I don't think the, the sense of what makes a man attractive has, has necessarily changed quite so much over time. Maybe there's only about half a dozen, half a dozen different kind of forms there. Okay, so coming back to some of these scandalous stories about yeah. her, um, I want to know uh, how sure are we that these stories about her are true? Well, um, we know that she existed, uh, and we know that several historical events seem to happen when they were supposed to happen. But uh, as I've already said. We've got a whole bunch of people lying to each other about what the facts actually are. So the degree to which she had a relationship with Taizong, for example, is open to question. When Wu was a teenage girl, she was all for it. When Wu was a middle-aged woman, she denied it ever happened. When Wu was an old lady, she boasted about the relationship she had with Taizong. So which is it? You know, people themselves are often unreliable witnesses in their own testimonials. So we have that historiographical problem with, with the testimonies that people make. Wu herself is an unreliable witness. So is the historical record, um, mainly because it's written by men, mainly because it's written by the regime that came after Wu that desperately wanted to wipe her out. So what we end up doing sometimes is a, is a, a rather rare historical process called abduction. We can't deduce things because we can't trust the sources that we have, but we can abduce things by looking at what's missing from the sources and asking ourselves what people are leaving out. So for example, late in life, Wu got to be, uh, uh, she, she kind of flirted with Buddhism a bit and um, she uh, tried to purge herself of sins. And that meant that she begged for forgiveness for certain acts that she committed in her life. Um, so we know, for example, based on Wu's own begging for forgiveness, that the story about what she did to Empress Wung and um, Xiao Langdi is true, that she had them walled up and left to die uh, under house arrest and, you know, kind of fed food through a, a little, little hutch in the wall. Um, and that Gao Zong discovered that they had just kind of been left there without makeup and without, you know, shampoo uh, for months and months. Uh, and, he, and, uh, and he said, oh, I, I didn't know you were here, ladies. I'll, I'll see what I can sort out. And he kind of scurried off. And they said, oh, God, thank God for that. We've been saved. And then they hear someone chipping away at the bricks. And, and they go, oh, God, they've come to save us. But it's not. It's soldiers that Wu has sent. And they are there with orders to beat them up, to break their limbs, and to throw them into a vat of wine to drown. And Wu says, those two bitches can get drunk to their bones. Uh, which was a very interesting thing to say, because being drunk to the marrow is classical Chinese for having an orgasm. Uh, she's basically saying, fuck them both to death. Uh, but before they go, she makes sure that they know that their surnames are going to be changed in the afterlife so that they have, they're, they're called snake and owl and they have horrible names, so they'll have bad karma. And, and Xiao Langdi, the, the pure concubine, she says, Wu is a treacherous fox. I hope I shall be born as a cat and the bitch Wu as a rat that I may bite out her throat. So anyway, no love lost there. Um, but Wu begged for the forgiveness from them in her old age. So we believe that's actually true. But what she didn't beg for forgiveness for is one of the other crimes that she's been accused of, which is strangling her own newborn daughter, which oh makes God. me think that it didn't happen. Um, uh, it, it may well be that there is a tragedy there and that Wu had a baby who didn't live very long. Um, but uh, the last person seen holding the baby alive was the Empress Wung. And so... Um, we use that to get the empress, um, you know, overthrown, and she and Wu was accused in in early life of of having strangled her own daughter so she could frame the empress, 
and it doesn't seem and, and i find that to be very unlikely you know there is a school of woo fans who think that yes she did that because she was a total serial killer and she would do anything but i find that unlikely and the fact that woo didn't beg for forgiveness for it late in life makes me think that it didn't happen similarly um there was a revolt against woo in uh, 684 ad um and i spent a very happy couple of days translating the kind of uh, the big speech of, of the prince who was leading the rebellion uh, which goes on and on and on about all the crimes that Wu has committed. So uh, she can. So uh, here we go. I've got it here. This woman Wu has seized the empire, ascending through false means, unyielding, unyielding and cold. Formerly, she was a minor servant of the Taizong Emperor, her tasks including the changing of his clothes. But as she grew, she brought discord to the palace of the crown prince. She concealed her relationship with the former emperor. Her shadow fell on the walls of the court. She entered the gate through deception, and all fell before her moth brows. She whispered slander from behind her sleeves and swayed her master with her vixen flirting. She trampled on the pheasant regalia of the empress and entrapped her prince in incest. With the heart of a serpent and the nature of a wolf, she gathered sycophants to her cause and brought destruction to the just. She slew her sister, butchered her brothers, killed her prince and poisoned her mother. Anyway, this is what Wu is accused of by her enemies. But what is fascinating about it is that there are a whole bunch of stories, for example, as I just said, killing her daughter, um, which are not mentioned in these accusations. Um, and if anyone was going to you know, find something to pin on her, and they and had even heard that story, they would have been sure to put it in that kind of invective. So what we end up doing uh, by abduction is we use the, the the words of Wu's own enemies as testimony in her defence. So then, how much trust can we actually place in these historical sources? Well, uh, as much as you want. Uh, at some point, someone has to you know draw a line. And um, this is the kind of methodology that we have to use to draw those lines. Um, we can say, okay, there's, there's, there's a lot of whispering uh, about Wu. There's a lot of accusations against her. Um, there are, uh, she definitely tried to manipulate what we might now call the media in her own time. Um, there are all these portents, for example, that keep showing up about, you know, a chicken born with three legs, which is a sign of a female messiah and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and we, we imagine that this is all nonsense. Um, but uh, the degree to which we can actually rule on what happened all those years ago is, is incredibly difficult. It doesn't help that the historical record has been muddied by so much fiction. So, you know, obviously Wu is an interesting fictional character uh, for a lot of authors. So you get things like, uh, there's a book, for example, called The Lord of Perfect Satisfaction, which is about basically all of Wu's sexual exploits. And it was written in the Ming Dynasty, I think, and, and it was um, all made up. You know, there's there's no real evidence there of anything. There were there were stories that Wu uh, would perform a sexual act that no one dared perform. But looking at the way that's phrased in the original Chinese, I think that has been somehow mistranslated. And what it means is that Wu pursued a sexual practice that no one else dared pursue, which was monogamy. Do you know, this is this is ringing alarm bells through history because, I mean, this is the same way that Messalina was treated in the ancient period, you know, calling her a great prostitute, a great whore, even yes. though she was the wife of the emperor, that she would go out and seduce and, and, and literally fuck every man that she saw. Mm. You know, yeah. so how much of this can realistically be true? You know, a, a, an empress or, or in her case, um, the wife of the emperor, I mean, still an empress. It's, it's just, it's mind boggling to how much slander can actually go through history. And a lot of this you're saying is written in the Ming Dynasty. So how do we know that's even true? Well, no, I mean, it, it isn't, the Lord of Perfect Satisfaction is not true. It was written as a novel. Uh, one of the recurring problems I have with Chinese history in, in many different fields is that a lot of Chinese history books are kind of semi-fictionalized or novelized in some way. Dialogue mm. is invented for people that cannot possibly have been overheard. Um, so, you know, I try and go back to the original chronicles, the original annals. Um, of course, the trouble with that is, is the annals themselves are often written a decade or more after something has happened. They themselves are subject to redaction. 
Um, so it can be very difficult to work out, you know, uh, you know who, who the good guys were. When it comes to someone like Messalina, absolutely, you are dealing with the easiest accusation to fling at a woman that doesn't require proof. You can exactly. just assume, well, just look at her, you know. Uh, and and so so this kind of slut shaming um, is incredibly common in Chinese history. I mean, within Wu's lifetime, it shows up fifty or sixty times in the in the various dynastic accounts. Particularly because, and this is something that I really I should have mentioned before, uh, there's a lot of witchcraft and accusations of witchcraft being flung around the palace in the time of Wu and, and successive uh, generations. And this is in partly because this is partly because witchcraft throughout history has been used as a kind of code for women's issues. Because the women of the palace, as you can well imagine, are obsessed with their looks. They're obsessed with their health. They're obsessed with their reproductive capability. Um, and so they are leaning on potions and poultices and drugs. Um, and this means that they are dealing with dealers. There are, there are men, particularly Buddhist priests, Taoist priests, kind of sneaking into the palace with this kind of new herb they've got that they guarantee will do something for you. Um, and so these women are having clandestine meetings or sending their servants to have clandestine meetings with, with drug dealers, with dodgy priests. Uh, and, and so one of the primary accusations that's made uh, against women in, in palace politics is either witchcraft, trying to have your opponents killed, trying to put a curse on that new girl, but also spell casting and having affairs with these pushers. You know, um, pr you know, if someone has, you know, too many meetings with a Taoist priest discussing enlightenment, well, maybe they're fucking as well. And this oh, is certainly God. something that certainly something that Wu was accused of um, on several occasions. Um, and I suspect in at least one of them, it was true. Um, she had an affair. Uh, it appears that she had an affair with, with a man who was building this massive temple for her, uh, which has recently been recreated in, in Luoyang. Um, and he had a, a, a way about him in the palace. You know, he was he was put on trial for uh, various uh, accusations against him. He showed up you know, on horseback in the courtroom. There's something about him that makes me think he thought he could get away with anything. Um, but uh, but yes, the, the, this idea of, of slut shaming throughout history of, you know, because women don't have control over the over the historical record, um, they can so easily be shunted out. Shang Guan Wan Er, for example, the, the prime minister I mentioned, there was a palace coup after Wu's death and about I think it was in 712. Um, and uh, Shang Guan Wan Er honestly thought she was safe and she walked out to meet the soldiers waving a document in her hands that proved that she wasn't one of the rebels. They didn't give a shit. They just killed her. Uh, and so that's her cancelled. That's her poetry burned so that no one knows what he, her poems were. That's all of her acts as prime minister, in which course she oversaw one of the heights of the Tang Dynasty and one of the greatest you know, political successes of China. That all gets wiped out. And she's just some forgotten woman. We're lucky we know her name. I just... It, it angers me to see these women being wiped out of the historical record. Mm. These smart women who made a difference just because the records are held by men. Yes. And as something that I mentioned in the Confucian uh, podcast as well, um, a lot of this goes back to Bronze Age ethics, to Confucius's well-intentioned idea that women stay indoors and are protected by the men and the men get on with all the politics and stuff and that it is uh, rude to address a lady by her name and it is ungracious to write her name in records. And so, you know, you could call that chivalry if you like, you could call it ridiculous sexism, but what it means is, is that 50% of the Chinese population are shunted out of the records. So at the end of the day, Wu is more or less acting and ruling just like a man, isn't she? Yes, and that's what no one could stand. Uh, the idea, because, uh, for example, during the reign of uh, Gao Zong, her, her, um, uh, her, her second husband, uh, he had a terrible stroke. Um, I mean, we don't know what it was. It, it may have been relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. It may have been a stroke. Whatever it was, he was basically incapacitated for 20 years. And Wu spoke on his behalf. And that's how she ran things for, for, for two decades. 
Um, and one of the things that she said was that there's this big um, uh, ceremony called the Feng Shang sacrifice, which is when, when life is perfect on earth, you report to heaven and you say all is well. And this is incredibly rare. It's only happened like half a dozen times in Chinese history. And it's a huge undertaking. And one of the problems with it is, is that because it happens so rarely, no one knows how to do it. And so it takes 20 years to kind of get your boffins working on what the ceremony should be, because you can't bodge the ceremony because then things won't be perfect anymore. And they head up to Mount Tyre to have this ceremony. And, uh, and they're almost there. And then and there's Wu's, you know, crippled husband being carried along in a litter. And Wu suddenly says, you know what? I think I've worked out what's wrong. There's yin and yang. There's male and female. This ceremony is always being conducted by men. Women should share half the limelight. Otherwise, it's never going to work. And, and Gao Zong says, and she says, yeah, well, what he says, everybody, is that I'm right. And this is what we should do, because that's how she kind of interpreted for him. So she and her chambermaids form half the ceremony. Women form half of the ceremony. And it's very difficult to argue with Wu because China, you know, Taoist philosophy is all about this yin and yang stuff and, and equality of opposites. Um, the thing about Wu is that as she got older, she, um, she became the emperor. She took on the aspects of a male emperor, too. Male emperors were supposed to have all of these concubines because of um, it was supposed to bring them long life by uh, by um, feeling the essences of their sexual partners. It was supposed to impart them with what was hoped to be immortality. And so we said, well, I think I should do that, too. <laughs> and so she had a harem of 120 pretty boys who kept her company in her old age. Um, Why not? Why? Well, this is what a man would do. This, this is and, and, and the only issue here is that a woman is doing it. Um, and so, uh, but there, there is something else going on here as well. I've, I've already mentioned that the Confucian conservatism doesn't like the idea of women being in charge. But here's the thing about Wu's era. Um, the Tang Dynasty uh, and the, the Sui Dynasty that preceded it for a few years, but basically the Tang Dynasty came at the end of a huge period of unrest in China, of several hundred years of barbarian incursions and of, of China being um, fragmented into multiple little states. The Tang Dynasty reasserted itself, but Taizong reasserted himself um, by kind of gently not mentioning to anybody that he was three quarters nomad. Taizong is presented in the history books as a great Chinese emperor, but his genes were Xiongnu and Xianbei. He was basically much more nomad than he was Chinese. Ah. Um, and he held off the, 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 the nomads of the central plains, in part by becoming their Khan as well. He was a Tengri Khan, which is the, uh, the, the, the Grand Khan of the steppes as well. So the, the story as told by the Chinese record is great emperor does stuff. His wife turns up. She's a bitch. What the, the record doesn't really go into is great nomad chieftain conquers China behaves exactly like a nomad chieftain is supposed to by fighting his brothers for the throne because this is blood tanistry and this is how we do it um treats his wife and, and of course his son treats his wife the way that nomads treat their women giving them power giving them authority leaving them in charge of the wealth and so what you're actually seeing here below the surface is not merely a Confucian conservative backlash against women in power it's a, a Han ethnicity backlash against foreigners, against immigrants, against these foreign ways. China has suddenly been restored, but the Chinese want it to be a Han state. They want it to be ethnically Chinese. They don't want any of these nomad customs surviving. And one of those is women in a position of power. So the vehemence of this backlash against Wu and uh, her daughters and her, and her, and, and her granddaughter um, are are really about the, the Han people, the Chinese people who, who've lost power, actually. And the only way they can get along is by marrying their daughters into this foreign aristocracy. Uh, of course, the hope is always in China by the Chinese that these foreign invaders come in and within a few generations, they've gone native. Um, but, you know, it, it, I think it's very interesting that very few accounts of the Tang Dynasty really dwell on just quite how nomad influenced it was. And so every time you hear about contacts with the nomad peoples, contacts with the Mongols, for example, or the, um, or the, um, the, the various tribes of Central Asia, what they're not mentioning is that these are their relatives. So that is one mm -hmm. of the things um, that I think is not very familiar in the historical record. Wu isn't just acting like a man. She's acting like a Turkic nomad. Um, 
and the Chinese establishment wants to get rid of as many of these influences as possible so that they can click back on to being Chinese, which would then means purging foreign influences. And so the cosmopolitanism of Wu's era, um, within 100 years, 150 years, it had completely turned around and there were these desperate, these terrible purges of foreigners, massacres of, of, of the Hu, of the barbarians, backlashes against Hu traditions, which included you know, women wearing trousers, going out without veils, that kind of thing. Um, Christianity was, you know, purged. Um, the Muslims were advised to, you know, maybe dress like the locals and not, not kick up a fuss. Um, so, you know, um, many aspects of, of the cosmopolitan culture that, that made Wu's age so interesting were gone within a century um, by the same kind of forces that were trying to purge women from power. I'm really interested if she was so hated, but she's so hated by history. Hmm. Why is she such an icon today then? Well, um, two reasons, really, two or three. One is that as China itself starts to fall apart in the late imperial era, there are challenges mounted to the system, which by this point is the Qing dynasty. So we're talking about the 19th century. There, there is an idea that uh, China has gone wrong somewhere and it needs to modernize, it needs to reform itself. And so questions inevitably are asked by radicals, by dissenters, um, as to whether or not um, Chinese conservatism has got it wrong. Um, uh, there's a very famous Chinese feminist uh, called He Yin Zhen. It's absolutely fascinating. She's writing in the very early 20th century. And she says, you know, the problem with the world is men. And, and the problem with China is Confucius and men like him are telling us how we should act. And women <laughs> should be equal and women should be um, have an equal role in society. Um, and so feminism uh, of a sort is incorporated into the parcel of reforms that are demanded by reformers. Feminism becomes incorporated into, uh, in, in a sense, the um, demands of the Chinese Republicans, but also into the demands of the Chinese communists. The first act, the first legal act of the Chinese communists was a reform to the marriage law, which um, uh, once, once they were in power, uh, which was designed to specify that women are equal, that patriarchy is not a thing, that women have to choose their own partners, that marriage is for the uh, mutual um, encouragement of two workers. It's not about the legitimacy of children. A whole parcel of things that are incredibly progressive that have been completely ignored over the, next, over the, last, the last few decades. So, so uh, feminism and you know, the right of women to be tractor drivers, to be generals, whatever, uh, is is very much incorporated within uh, communism, um, but Wu remains unspoken of for quite a while. Then, in the 1970s, Chairman Mao falls ill. Chairman Mao is going to die, um, and his wife Jiang Qing realizes that she needs to really big up the idea that an emperor can die and his wife can take over on his behalf. Ah, oh, okay. I can see where this is going. And so suddenly you get this in the early 70s, as Mao is on his deathbed, you get this eruption of, of works that celebrate Wu as this fantastic icon of feminism, as a woman who takes over and gets stuff done. Um, and so whereas the Republican Chinese are still discussing Wu like she's Stalin, um, you know, <laughs> Lin Yutang literally compared her to Stalin in the 1950s and said she was responsible for you know, hundreds of thousands of deaths. And, you know, we couldn't possibly um, call her a good person. But Jiang Qing is behind this. You know, she's in charge of Chinese cultural policy. So if she says, I think it would be great if we had a few more biographies of this Wu woman. Suddenly they show up. And so Wu becomes pushed as this fantastic icon of, of, of female power. Now, Jiang Qing does not last long. She is brought down along with her, um, her, her gang of four. Um, and so um, uh, Jiang Xing's policy doesn't work, but that has now established Wu as a feminist icon. And of course, as we move into uh, the 1980s, as China reforms and looks for historical stories to tell, the, the, the allure, the, 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 contra the controversy and, the, uh, and the, the sexual politics of Wu's era is just irresistible. Um, there, I mean, there are so many approaches that you can make. I personally find the stories that are told about her are very much kind of like a uh, 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 Dexter that, uh, that she, she's oh, some yeah. she's a kind of serial killer who's trying to do good 
um, you can tell it just like Cinderella, but she's still going to have to stab people. We, we know that she did commit some murderous acts. Um, the, the issue with Wu that is, is often overlooked or celebrated, depending on where you stand, is, is that she didn't kill any more people than a male emperor would. You know, Tai Zong literally murdered his own brothers to become the emperor. Mm. So Wu, you know, poisoning a few people and, you know, having a few people executed. Um, it's, it's not shocking in Chinese history. It is not, it is not uh, an outlier in any way. She is literally behaving just like the men, but somehow we should censure her for this because she's a woman. It's like one rule for them and one rule for us. That's the bottom line. Jonathan, this is just, uh, I'm so delighted that I managed to talk to you about this. I mean, Empress Wu, do you know what? I, I have a lot of respect for her. I think she's a really interesting woman. And um, listen, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you go and grab yourself a copy of Jonathan's book just to remind you it's Wu, the Empress, the Chinese Empress who schemed, seduced and murdered her way into becoming a living God. And go and grab yourselves a copy from our bookshop. Jonathan, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You can help us at History Hack by joining us via Patreon. It takes quite a lot of effort and a lot of work of quite a big team now to keep us going. And so if you could donate as little as £3 a month, it would be massively appreciated by all of us. There's different levels because Princess Marcus has set it all up with uh, varying rewards and things. So do have a look. Do join us. There's uh, an exclusive Facebook group as well and you could be part of all of it. When our guests join us to talk about their work in their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great 